I'm going to read the Hebrew scripture, Hosea, 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept, they kept sacrificing to the box and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Admar? How can I treat you like Zebul? My heart reposes within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord, who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt like doves from the land of Assyria, and I, and I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. Galatians 3, verses 1 through 11. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you, will, you also will be, will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. Amen. Amen. Consist in the abundance of possessions. 
Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. May God bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the acting upon this portion of God's holy and divine word. Notice that, I'm going to be talking about greed in a minute, in case you didn't get that from the uh, scripture, from the gospel. Notice that Paul calls greed idolatry. Not just greed, but greed is building up an idol. Paul calls it idolatry. We'll get back to that in a minute. I just want to put that in your head and remind you about that from Paul's letter to um, the church of Colossians. In today's scripture, uh, it's kind of interesting. There, there are a couple of interesting parts. And the first little two passages... I want to share with you just because I think it's, it's interesting. Again, this is, uh, as I did, said last week, maybe at some point in the future I'll circle back and preach about that. But for the time being, we'll just consider it a place keeper. I'm just going to mention it and share a thought and let you mull it over and let you take it as, as your own to, to play with and, and to consider. Consider that uh, someone in the crowd is is looking for something. He's being a little greedy, let's be honest. Someone in the crowd says to him, teacher, and this is not unreasonable in first century uh, Hebraic religion that, that someone would come to the rabbi to make these kind of decisions and to make this kind of call. So he says to him, teacher, tell my brother, give me money. He says, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And notice Jesus' response to him. This is significant. Maybe I will preach. No, I'll preach on this. But this is significant because it shows how Jesus prioritizes things. This person wants money and wants Jesus to be the arbitrator. Jesus, tell my brother to give me my part of the family inheritance. Basically, Jesus says, why? Why are you looking for me to be the arbitrator between the two of you? Notice that Jesus literally dismisses this guy. Why? That's how insignificant that greed and that money is in, in the mind of the Almighty as God is presented to us in Jesus Christ. Now, with that as a backdrop, let's talk about greed. Let's talk about real greed. And I'm going to mention um, uh, being a good pastor. I'm aware of church politics. And by church politics, I mean the fact that there are certain things that pastors are allowed to say that fall within the confines of the church, but certain things they're not allowed to say. For example, this morning when I mentioned Donald J. Trump, and yes, I am going to mention Donald J. Trump, I'm going to mention Donald J. Trump as a businessman. I understand, I've heard, that he's also running for some office. But, but my reference specifically is to Mr. Trump as a businessman. And I, I hasten to say that because that is significant in terms of my role as a pastor of the church. And the reason I say that is because I want to contrast what we're hearing here from Jesus in Luke with regard to a specific comment that um, Mr. Trump has made. 
Let's think again about what's going on in this passage. In this passage, we hear um, Jesus say to, remember this person was just asking to give him some bucks, give him his brother's bucks, part of the family inheritance. And Jesus says, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possession. And then he tells a parable. I gotta tell you, uh, I'm not without a whole lot of college education. And probably one of the things that I like reading most in the world are Jesus' parables. There are just so many levels and so telling and so much there. Uh, we could get lost in one parable for weeks. So he tells a parable, and in this parable, when the rich man produced abundant crops, lots of stuff, and he thought to himself, what should I do? We should all have this problem. What should I do? I have so much, I have so much stuff, and I don't have a place to keep all my stuff. I have so, I own so much, that I don't have a place to keep everything that I own. This is, the, this is the protagonist in Jesus' parable. That's the problem he starts out with. I own so much stuff that I don't have a place to keep all my stuff. What am I going to do? So he decides to put a, build a tower and put his name on <laughs> Just kidding. But, but I'm not joking. He decides to tear down stuff and build new buildings. Big enough for him to keep his stuff. And when he's done tearing down buildings and building new buildings that are large enough for him to keep all of his stuff, what does he say? He's very self-satisfied. He's very pleased with himself. He says, in fact, and we all hear this because it's in our pop, our pop culture, it's uh, a, a pop culture uh, comment, uh, what's left for me to do now except eat, drink, and be merry? not caring a whole lot for the people around him, is he? What's left for me to do? Talk about, talk about a, a cliche that says, I've got it made, I'm looking out for number one, and I've got it made, you're on your own. What's left for me to do but eat, drink, and be merry? Sorry for you to be who you are. So he tears down buildings and builds up new buildings enough for his stuff. And once he gets all of his stuff, all of his grain, all of his abundance in his new buildings, he says, I will say to myself, soul, you have got plenty what's left for you to do. But eat, drink, and be merry. And God responds to him in Jesus' parable. We, we, we kind of like this part of it. It's like karma. You're going to get what you deserve. So we kind of like this part of it. God goes back and says, you fool. What? Let's, and let's not, uh, um, Jesus says, this very night your life is being demanded out of you. Um, let's move a little bit even beyond the translation. Um, God says to him, you're going to die. Tonight's the night. Yeah, how's that for uh, knowing that the, the grim reaper is like knocking, pounding, not pounding at your door. This is it. I can't imagine that, that feeling of God saying, okay, time out. I mean, he's, and, and Jesus is saying in the parable, God says to him, you fool, you're going to die this night. The things that you've prepared, these buildings that you've built, and the stuff that you've acquired, the stuff that you've put into them, Who's that going to belong to? God said, God saying to him, it must be tough to be you. After, after this rich man said to the poor people around him, after he's got all this stuff, it must be tough to be you. God said, it must be tough to be you. And then Jesus says, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God.
This man believed that life existed in possessions, in money. This man's greed was idolatry. He saw, not God, but he saw life in things. He saw life in possessions. He believed that life was made or built or fulfilled as a result of things that you own. Now, I told you I was going to mention Donald Trump. Contrast, and it's just going to be brief, because there's one particular quote that sticks with me when I read this passage from Luke. Consider what Jesus has told us here in the parable contrasted with a quote from Mr. Trump, in which Mr. Trump says, and I'm quoting now, you must be wealthy to be great. That's a quote. You must be wealthy to be great. It is tough for us Please believe I understand greed. It is tough for us for two reasons that I want to share with you. It is tough for us to divorce ourselves from money and from acquisition. For two very, very powerful, very significant reasons. One reason that it's tough for us to divorce ourselves from what Paul calls the root of all evil. Paul says, the love of money is the root of all evil. One reason that it's tough for us to divorce ourselves from the love of money, from the love of possessions, from the love of money, is that on a very basic biological level, you know I should talk about biology this morning, did you? Money means something. I've mentioned to you in the past um, uh, Abraham Maslow and the hierarchy of needs. And I've told you that there are very basic physical needs at the bottom of Abraham Maslow's description of all of the things a human needs. He describes all the things that humans need. And at the very bottom of that are physical descriptions, all the way up through more esoteric and more philosophical um, needs, uh, longing needs, belonging needs, security needs. But, but, at the very bottom of that level, our physiological needs. And I'm here to tell you in 2016, as, as hard as it is for us as Christians to live with this, physiological needs cost money. I'm betting, and this is a pretty safe bet, I'm betting that not one of you raised every bit of food that you have consumed during the past year. You might have a tomato vine. I might have a little garden, although I've got to say I haven't received any tomatoes from my conference. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. You might have a little tomato vine, you might have a little garden. I'm, uh, some of you may have, and, and where I used to live in Chevrolet, Maryland, down in Washington, D.C., this was always a big point of contention. It's a, like a little community like Willingboro, it was always a big point of contention. There were a few families that wanted to raise chickens, and some people thought, no, chickens in an urban setting weren't appropriate, other people weren't. Some of you may have tomato vines, some of you may have little gardens or cucumber vines or whatever. I'm betting none of you raised a, uh, a cow, I'm betting none of you have a herd of beef. I'm betting none of you raised all the food that you consumed this past year. You would say, oh, I'm going to go ahead. And show of hands, is there anyone in here who, who raised every bit of food that you've consumed during the past year. And I'm, trust me, I'm going to call you on this. <laughs> no. So the problem is, the first of the two reasons that, that this scripture is tough for us, that money is significant for us, is that it costs food to go to ShopRite. Or it costs money, rather, to go to ShopRite and get food. I've tried. They won't just give me stuff. <laughs> And I, even if I wear my collar, even if I look good and smile nicely, 
and they, they won't, won't hand over food. I can't figure <laughs> out what they're thinking. It costs us money. The, uh, I have, uh, what is it, American Water, New Jersey American Water. They'll turn off the water coming in through the pipes if I don't pay for the water. So very basic needs, food and water, are going to cost us money, so we cannot completely divorce ourselves from money. It's just that simple. And that's one of the reasons that money is significant to us, because at some level of existence, money equates to survival. I've got to have stuff. I've got to have food. I've got to have water. A roof over my head is nice. Again, very basic physiological needs. And someone's going to charge me for those. It's that simple. So that's the first reason that money is significant to us. And, and it's hard for us to divorce ourselves from money. Say, oh, money doesn't mean anything at all to me. Bull! It's probably keeping you alive to some extent, wherever that money's coming from. Whether you're handing it over to American... New Jersey American Water, or whether you're handing it over to ShopRite, or whether you're handing it over to Mr. Landlord or Mr. Mortgage Holder, that money is, is fulfilling some basic physical need that you have to stay alive. So it's hard for us, and, and probably phony for us to say, oh, money doesn't mean anything at all to me. It does. It has to, because of the rules. The second reason, those of you who have attended the Plato's Cave Study Series, this is your moment to shine. The second reason it's important to us is because that's how our culture behaves. I had... Could you tell the little guys running around the back of my head debating whether or not I want to tell this particular story? I had a, a regional minister when I was in the Sutton's Price, which is our, our equivalent of our uh, conference group. Had a regional minister say uh, to a congregation, and now imagine uh, our conference minister saying this to you. And, I'm, and I'm, as I told you, I'm being absolutely honest, I'm not even sure how I feel about it. Say to the congregation, you need to, to give your pastor a raise. And the reason you need to give your pastor a raise is because the only way in our culture that we show appreciation for sustained good performance, good uh, superior service for a uh, uh, job well done, is money. I'm not sure I'm buying it. But a regional minister said that to a congregation. In our culture, we are married to money. The American dream relates to a picket fence and a house and a chicken in your pot. And I'm, and I'm actually, right this moment, already regretting having phrased that like that, but no pot jokes later when you're leaving. I don't think you're um, the, but, but the American dream relates to possessions. When was the last time, and be honest with yourself, when was the last time you heard the American dream articulated without any reference at all to economics? When was the last time you heard either a Republican National Convention or a Democratic National Convention where everything was geared toward economics? I'm going to make you better off. We are a country and a culture. And we are enculturated. We are taught by those who come before, before us that life is about faith. Life is about possession. And it's hard. It is hard, 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 my sisters and brothers, for us to move beyond. So when we say, oh, money's not all that important to me, I'm above that. Money isn't uh, basic to me. Money isn't where I live. I've got to call you on that because, first of all, it's a basic physiological need, and it's going to provide food. It's going to provide roof. It's going to provide water. Secondly, it's what our culture is all about. It's who we are as a culture. And it's hard for us to get through an entire day and not hear about ownership. 
then we contrast Mr. Trump's quote, you can only be great if you're wealthy, and we contrast our need to pay for physical uh, needs, and our culture's emphasis on ownership and possessions, and we contrast that with Jesus saying, you fool, you're going to die. And then what good is that going to do? It's quite a simple lesson. And Jesus wraps it up in that parable and he says, it's about richness in God. I expect all of you, I expect all of you to eat this week and to drink and to be healthy and come back next week. I expect that. That's your assignment from your pastor. And you're going to need money to do that. I expect you to eat and drink, be healthy, and come back next to you. God expects you to eat, drink, be healthy. You're a child of God. You're part of God's creation. You are a beloved part of God's creation. But that all breaks down when money starts replacing richness in God. If that money is keeping you from sharing with your brother or sister, if that money is keeping you from sharing with your neighbor, if that money is keeping you from looking out for that person in need, if that money is keeping you from basic decency and from loving the people around you and caring for the people around you and looking for the people around you, that's no longer richness in God, that's richness in this world, in the world. That's what we've got to look at. That's, I told you it's a simple lesson. God says, you fool, you're going to die. What are the good of those possessions going to do? And God warns us against richness in this world, about failing to look out and care for, to love and to be decent. And God warns us about not looking out for striving for richness in God. My prayer for you, my sisters and brothers, is that you may have all that you need, that when you go to ShopRite, you'll be able to pay the bill, but also, what's more important, that you will know and have richness in God. Amen.